Well, Fiskamavaludunyasvalsu, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing's fifth meeting of 2019. We have apologies from Stuart Stevenson. Now, agenda item work, um, uh, our first item business today is to consider whether to take agenda item three, which is about our work programme, in private. Uh, are we agreed about that? Agreed. OK, thank you very much indeed. Agenda item two is capital resources for Police Scotland in the Scottish Government's budget, 2019-20. Um, and I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome to the committee Chief Superintendent Ivor Marshall, President of the Association of Police Superintendents, Callum Steele, General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, and David Malcolm, Police Staff Scotland, a Deputy Branch Secretary of Eunice in Scotland. You're all very welcome. And thank you too for your written submissions, which are always very helpful. And we're just going to move straight to questions. There's a lot of ground to cover. And Daniel is the first question. Thank you. Thank you, And I think when there's discussion of capital budgets, that can sometimes be a little bit confusing for people. People understand what revenue gets spent on, but it's not necessarily immediately obvious what the impact of capital budgets or lack of capital budgets is. I was just wondering if each of the panellists could maybe bring to life their view on what the impacts in, in terms of delivering policing is on, uh, uh, of the current uh, level of capital budget that's being provided to the police. Uh, thank you, and through yourself, Chair. This, the simple reality is, is that the, the lack of capital funding uh, can't be looked at just in financial year 1920. It ha has to be looked in the general picture as to what uh, the police service has gone through since its formation as a single police service, and indeed, to some extent, what was invested uh, in the police service by the former forces, um, because ultimately the investment decisions that were made yesterday have an impact on what's available or what's required to be done today. But undoubtedly, whilst there is a tendency to concentrate on the big glamorous um, areas of expenditure, like IT, you know, regardless of whether uh, people regard the I6 project as a success or a failure, uh, capital goes much further than that. It, it goes to the replacement of vehicles, it goes to the building uh, of new premises if they're required uh, for, for modernisation. Uh, but it can't be looked at in isolation, uh, because a modest or, or derisory, or to paraphrase a colleague of mine, uh, a capital settlement that equates to hee-haw, uh, has a direct impact on revenue funding as well, because much more uh, of the care and maintenance side of, um, of, the, of the available funding has to be directed into trying to maintain uh, things which are well past their serviceable best. So the impact of uh, a lack of, uh, or insufficient depending on which uh, particular political heart or language you wish to use, uh, capital funding uh, is quite significant across the totality of police service, uh, from replacement of uniform, uh, provision of uh, fleet, uh, of buildings, of a state, of infrastructure. Uh, and the simple fact is, is that through, um, uh, you know, through the creation of the police service uh, of Scotland, we inherited, and I use the royal we here, we inherited uh, a disparate set of arrangements um, in terms of infrastructure across the whole of Scotland. And uh, we, we, and I use again the royal we, we require considerable investment uh, to be able to put that right. Chair, for yourself, uh as far as the impact um, of capital and revenue, I think the impact is fundamentally about service delivery to citizens of Scotland. Um, you can always trace it back to that one way or the other. I agree with um, Mr Steele that the issues in terms of revenue and capital are inextricably linked in terms of how it operates. It's in terms of accountancy and the allocations of capital funding vis-a-vis -vis revenue. But absolutely, I've travelled the country in recent months speaking to colleagues in command teams, and their position is that they're frustrated at times that they don't have um, the autonomy necessarily and the budget, and even in terms of revenue, to be able to do small repairs to buildings and so forth, um, so that that prevents a big capital spend. You know, So if you leave things for a long period of time, and Callum's quite right, we've inherited a legacy around some of these things. But over a period of time, buildings, it's the same at home. You know, if you if you don't um, do the small repairs, then it becomes a big capital project, and that's not uh, effective or efficient in the long term. Um, but in terms of what capital is usually spent on and has been traditionally, yeah, big ICT projects, um, estates, fleet, specialist equipment, firearms equipment, specialist equipment in in that regard. Um, but fundamentally, if you don't invest in these things, um, 
sufficiently over a capital programme over a period of time. And I think it's always very difficult with yearly budgets because capital programmes take a long time to, to scope out, commission, tender, deliver. Um, it takes a long time to deliver against these. And if we don't have that sustained investment over that period of time, fundamentally then the officers are working with suboptimal equipment in suboptimal conditions. Therefore, they are not as productive or as effective. Ergo, um, the service to the public is undermined as a consequence of that. Mr. Malcolm, do you have anything to add? Uh, you, you, yeah. Automatically, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, yeah, I've, I um, echo the sentiment of my colleagues here. Um, certainly, um, from our point of view, at Unison, uh, representing the police staff, we, I mean, it says in our paper, you know, that it's never been asked how much does it actually cost to deliver an effective police service. We are, we are constantly asking how much money do you actually have to run that police service and how much do we have to spend on um, these projects. The estates, fleet management and the ICT are all, you know, the, we don't feel that they're, they're funded appropriately to, to deliver what is needed um, to service Scotland. Um, our members are then trying their best to make it work, along with our officer colleagues. Um, you know, and you are looking then at effectively the, the phrase that's constantly used as a sticking plaster that's put over um, to, to just try and get by. Thank you. I think a number of my colleagues are interested in going to the, the specifics, whether it's a equipment, estates or ICT. But I, I'd like to just stick on in terms of just with one last question, in terms of the how to understand the capital budget. I mean, again, I think it's one of these budget lines where you see a number and you don't know whether it's a large number or a small number. Um, it, it, I believe the capital budget uh, for the, the current financial year is 2.9 per cent of uh, the, the revenue budget. If you compare that to the fire service, uh, their capital budget equates to 9.9% of their revenue budget. If you look at the, the uh, capital budget on a per employee basis, it's 1,526. If we were to compare that to the Metropolitan Police Force, which is a comparably sized force, they have a capital budget of £10,857 per employee. Uh, now, Admittedly, they've got a, a, rev a capital plan which will see their capital budgets reduced in coming years, but it will still remain relatively much higher than it is in Scotland. I'm just wondering, those are some benchmarks. What do the panel think would be a sensible benchmark for us to be use, using to assess the capital budget for Police Scotland? Is it comparator agencies within Scotland? Is it comparator forces? What, what, what should we be using as our, our rule of thumb to judge the, the capital allocation for Police Scotland? If I may convene, I'll, I'll have a pop at that one first. Uh, I don't think that you can really uh, neatly uh, find a, a direct comparator for the Police Service of Scotland, principally because it's a relatively new entity. <clears throat> it, doesn't have, it doesn't have established infrastructure that it created for itself. It doesn't have, uh, arguably, its, uh, its buildings and its people, uh, although its people are, are, are lesser consideration in, in terms of this discussion, where it wants them. It certainly doesn't have the IT uh, infrastructure that the likes of the Metropolitan Police has had decades to develop and have fit for their own organisational needs. Uh, but if we consider, for argument's sake, that the Metropolitan Police, uh, ha with its established infrastructure, has such a high, or a relatively high, uh, capital allocation per, uh, per head, then you can think that that's where the Police Service of Scotland needs to be. Uh, and certainly it shouldn't be starting off any less than that. But comparing it to comparable or, or compa comparing it to some kind of uh, other agency within Scotland, I think, would be unhelpful. But I do think that the direct comparison with the fire service in terms of proportionality of, of, of capital allocation is really interesting because this isn't the first year that this has happened. I think it was, if it wasn't last year, it was certainly the year before, where in cash terms alone, pure cash terms, the capital allocation for the fire service was twice that that was available to the police service. Now, I'm sure that the fire service put together a very strong and reasoned argument as to why that should be the case, uh, but the simple fact is, is that those that were responsible for making budget decisions and to some extent, that's every single one of you as parliamentarians, uh, didn't uh, seem to get particularly exercised about that at the time. So the service found itself on, on a cash term basis, having less to spend uh, on a more complicated service 
with more complex needs than the fire service for its capital uh, for its capital needs, although it arguably would present uh, a similar a similar position that it was bringing together uh, disparate uh, arrangements across the former forces uh, across the former uh, uh, fire and rescue services. Uh, so my my view is, is that we need to get to something that is at least comparable to what the Metropolitan Police has. But in order to get to that, we have to be given the opportunity to establish the infrastructure that they themselves have developed over decades. I would concur with uh, Callum in terms of um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, equitable to be able to benchmark against other public sector or even private sector across Scotland. I think the best benchmarks are probably in policing because it is somewhat unique, complex, complicated um, type of, of work that we do. I think it is difficult given it's a national service and there's huge uh, issues in terms of rural aspects which the Metropolitan Police obviously uh, don't have, um, so I have to take that into account. Um, I know in terms of uh, benchmarking and certain statistics that um, the service and the SPA have looked at that um, Police Scotland is well at the bottom of the league table in terms of expenditure around about capital. Um, yeah, and, um, and given the, uh, as Callum sort of alluded to, um, the history of where we've come from, underinvestment in significant parts of the country um, prior to and since the inception of Police Scotland, um, we need to get from the bottom of that at least to mid-table, and that's going to uh, require significant sustained investment at the capital, not just in sort of one, two-year type programmes. They need to be over um, the next 10 years at least. Yeah, if I could assist Mr Marshall with that point. Uh, getting us to mid-table would require a doubling of the capital budget. As I've done that maths. Uh, <laughs> and, and if, I, if I may also uh, supplement that, convener, that would bring us to roughly the kind of capital funding that the service itself deemed was required for this year alone. Mr. Malcolm, do you have Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I would concur with my colleagues here again. Um, comparatively, I don't think there is an organisation within Scotland really that, that reflects what um, Police Scotland now is, um, being uh, made up of the, the former legacy forces. I do think that um, it does need to be looked at in terms of, of, of its individuality um, and wouldn't be surprised if in the future forces in England and Wales do look um, north to, to reflect upon how that's been done. Comparatively, yeah, when you look at the actual um, graph that was provided in the um, report to the, the Scottish Police Authority um, by um, um, James Gray himself, it, it does actually reflect how low um, the capital funding for Police Scotland is to many other police forces across Scotland, uh, sorry, across the UK that do not have the same amount of, the same area of geography to cover, the same staff, the same um, amount of police officers. Um, the Metropolitan is probably the fairest closest comparison, but I think in, in the future of release, Police Scotland is looking to develop its own um, standing. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. In the past, there's been an issue about a lack or even an absence of meaningful engagement with key stakeholders when SPA and Police Scotland are looking at the capital budget. Can the panel um, tell the committee what kind of input they've had on the funding required for an effective um, force in the recent round of, of discussions? I, again, uh, convener, um, I mean, the, the direct answer to that question is none. But I do think that it does require a degree of, uh, of, uh, of caveat being applied to it. The, from, a, from an awareness and a briefing perspective, there is much more engagement takes place now between so I, can, well, I can only speak for my organisation, between the SPF uh, and those that are responsible for the finances of the service. But when it comes to the actual decision making as to what the money is going to be spent on, there is nothing. Um, now, we could argue that that's a moot point because when you've got nothing to spend or near nothing to spend, having lots of people around the table to argue about <coughs> distribution of nothing is probably not particularly helpful, not least when we would expect those in very senior positions to have more than a fair idea of what the absolute priorities are for spending the tiny amount of capital funding that's available to them. But for all that, given and I know that this has been a thorny issue at this committee now for, I think, four or five years, uh, I would have hoped that we, ha we, we would at least have addressed the fact that I'm coming here before you every single year and giving the same answer. Uh, although it is caveated this year by saying that the general engagement 
on general money issues is much better than it's been before, uh, and uh, that's that's a good thing. So in terms of progress, there has been some, uh, but in terms of the actual decisions as to what we, I mean, I think we genuinely have meaningful input uh, as to what should be priorities for the police service. Uh, I think that the service and indeed the authority is missing a trick by uh, constantly keeping us at arm's length on that. Uh, and it's kind of counter to what the, the Parliament itself is doing. We now have pre-budget talks because it's recognised once the budget's kind of been set and you're um, commenting after the effect, that isn't the most effective way to, to do it. So in the Parliament here, we have pre-budget talks. We say what is, um, we think, the priorities. Not necessarily look at a budget available, but what is necessary. And that seems to me what you're talking about, what is actually required, never mind what we think we've got. And until you actually have these meaningful talks, it's, it's not going to move on. The other panel members, I'd be interested in their view too. Again, I'm in agreement with uh, Mr Steele's um, position that we are, I think, in a much more open and transparent um, exchange of information with the service and the uh, Scottish Police Authority in terms of the budgets and how it's getting spent. Um, we get briefed, um, the most recent briefing in detail uh, was about a couple of months ago from DCO page in terms of the priorities which the the force executive and the SPA had decided for the capital allocation that they had how that was going to be prioritized and spent so we were briefed on that aware of what that is but not part of any pre-budget decisions as you say or decision making process now that that could rightly be the case but I think um, Callum's points valid that you know many heads are sometimes better than than uh, one and uh, and it's uh, in terms of the viewpoints that, that we collectively can put forward on behalf of, of officers and staff, that might help inform um, any decisions about priorities and, and where the money may be spent. Um, in fairness to the service and to the SPA, they do seem to be focusing primarily um, the, the money that they have in terms of health and safety essential requirements and a prioritisation around the ICT programme, which is obviously only part of what was uh, hoped for in terms of the settlement. And Mr Malcolm? Yes, yeah, certainly the, um, any pre-engagement on certain budgets um, is absolutely nil. Um, we do learn um, about how money will be spent from a briefing. Um, normally someone will come along to a negotiating meeting to do that. Sometimes we are invited along um, to find out about that beforehand. Um, and often it, it's, it's just regards, um, we, we will be obviously dismayed at what what perhaps decisions have been made without any ability to early on influence that and speak to that and, and put forward suggestions f on behalf of our staff. So reflecting what my colleagues here have said. It's certainly been effective in our parliament and um, in terms of the committee following issues and, and certain funding allocation requesting things that wouldn't otherwise have been given funding, the COPF being a case in point, then I hope both Police Scotland and SPA are listening to what has proved a very effective means of deciding what's required for an effective um, police force um, if they adopt the same kind of approach that we have here. Thank you. And, uh, I appreciate the convener's willingness to let me come back in. Um, I, I, I completely agree uh, with you there, Ms Mitchell. And whilst uh, it's always dangerous, I think, to some extent, to try and second guess what the service and authority will say, mm. I am going to take something of a punt on this occasion uh, because I appreciate that they will probably be coming before you in, in a future session. Uh, and I suspect that they will rely very heavily on the fact that there was a strategy published and consulted upon uh, called Policing 2026, which was as wide as, as, as the Clyde, I think, as it would be a, a, a localism. Um, and they would say that the various different organisations, ASPS, Unison uh, and SPF, were given an opportunity to comment on that. And from there, they draw their priorities. Uh, if that is, would indeed be the position that they would be tending to take, I think that's a pretty cheap and uh, narrow, narrow uh, perspective. Well, you've got it well covered now, Mr Steele. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, prior to move to the next question, can I just come back? I don't know if it's yourself, Mr. Marshall or Mr. Steele, but uh, I would like to hear the panel's views and the opportunities that exist to have some revenue spend that would offset the potential for, for capital spend. So the role that inspecting um, uh, and any um, maintenance regime that may be in place now, we're well aware of the, the work the Staff Association has done in, in, in recent times with workplace inspections and some of that, but where does that sit with what Police Scotland should as employers have been doing with these premises. Is there a maintenance regime? Because clearly it's better to sort something than buy a new one. But Chair, I'll come in. I think it was myself introduced that um, directly in the evidence. But um, 
I think that's the, the issue is that revenue spend and capital can't be seen in sort of two separate. Um, they are inextricably linked. Um, my experience, um, as I say, speaking to my colleagues, uh, commanders around the country, is that um, in uh, maybe in other times uh, there was an element of local control uh, at command level in terms of a revenue um, flexibility that they were able to do um, relatively small repairs and prioritise that locally. Um, that was obviously has been centralised, and because of the pressures on the revenue budget that we've um, again debated long and hard uh, sometimes in, in this room and other places um, over the last five to six years, the squeeze on that um, has meant that that's uh, that, that flexibility is not there. That's not to say that there haven't been um, inspections going on, that there hasn't been um, attempts to make that happen. But um, as I say, my colleagues um, submit. Uh, into the centre in terms of requests for work, um, but again on a prioritised list, if it's um, tiles falling off a wall in a station somewhere, that's maybe not as um, doesn't hit the, the top line priorities vis-a-vis -vis some of the others but um, I think that's the issue is that if there was um, sufficient uh, allocation and, and the, I know the force has been working on a more stable revenue uh, uh, position, if that's the case then some of that would stave off some of the big capital issues then that start to materialise. Um, there is a significant health and safety element to all of this. My colleagues as commanders understand their personal and professional um, responsibilities in, in that regard. Um, and are keen to and continue to work with uh, colleagues, particularly in the SPF, who have got a health and safety expertise, who carry out station inspections. Um, and the, the intention and the, the methodology around about that would be to have a collective view on um, what the issues are, where the risks lie, get those um, prioritised and presented in a fashion, and working with the service and the SPA to have those addressed. Because the health and safety responsibilities for, come first and foremost in terms of um, the responsibilities. Yes, well, of course, we are here to discuss the capital, and it's me it's taken us on to revenue, but there is that linkage. I wonder, Mr Steele, if you could comment on that, perhaps with brief regard to some of the recent publicity about some of the stations. And can you advise, is that something that's done on behalf of other trade unions, Unison, for instance? The workplace inspections? Is I, I, it? If, I, if I'm being honest, I, I would prefer to leave Unison to, to speak for themselves. I, I certainly know that in the early days, we, we, as far as humanly possible, undertook joint inspections, not just with uh, the service, but with other staff associations. But the, I, I, I feel that it's really important here to highlight that the obligation to inspect the premises is one that sits with the, the employer and, and indeed with the, the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, and we are given repeated assurances that these inspections take place on at least a six monthly basis. Now, what we found in Oban and what we found in L Division did not develop in six months. So there are ob very obvious questions as to what they are doing with the results of their own inspections. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the last meeting of the Scottish Police Authority, but I do understand that the live stream also went down at a particularly unfortunate time uh, when the issue of L Division was being discussed. Uh, I'll leave it and, and say no more about it than the fact that it was unfortunate. Uh, but my understanding from those that were in attendance is that during the update that was being given at the, at the authority, uh, that the service indicated that there was nothing that had been identified in the SPF deep dive in L Division that they had not been aware of. Now, that in itself is frightening. Uh, the fact, so we, we this, and this does link back to the, the issue of uh, revenue and, and, and capital spending. The fact that the service was aware of this and apparently appeared not to have done anything about it until shamed into doing so by uh, a very uh, significant publication that, that, that we uh, made available uh, for principally for the benefit of our members but also for uh, parliamentarians also. And then suddenly there was money made available. I think to some extent gets back to the heart of the issues uh, that Mr Marshall highlights. Uh, there is no allocation as I understand it to divisional commanders for care and maintenance. Uh, that seems idiotic. Uh, the fact that the authority uh, with the service was suddenly able to find a sum of money and, more importantly, an initiative to go to try and fix it, and we'll take a differing view as to whether they fixed it or not, um, on the back of publicity uh, suggests that there may be not as open and as honest as to the extent to which they could be doing more in care and maintenance as they could be. So, uh, sorry, if it was known about who knew about it, and how was it recorded? If, if these matters are now dealt centrally, where perhaps historically they were dealt more locally, is there a maintenance regime and is there a register of defects? Uh, I, I'm sure 
convener, you appreciate that that's very much a, a question that would be best answered by the authority and won't be lost on you that those are questions that we will be raising in our subsequent full report um, that, uh, that will be completed in the near future. Okay, so, sorry, M Mr Malcolm, fairly yeah. brief. Um, so the, the, it, it always appears that when there's an operational or reputational risk that Police Scotland will be able to fix these things, um, but there doesn't appear to be a clear regime, that seems to be a question I'm asking, that they will, um, that, you know, this maintenance getting done, otherwise we wouldn't be in some of these situations that were highlighted by the, the Federation and the press. The, the Authority and Police Scotland have obviously um, inherited these um, properties and uh, situations from the legacy force areas. So it, it does go back to what Mr Steele was saying at the start of the session, that um, if these problems were there and not addressed before they've been brought into Police Scotland, then they continue. Um, and if there's not the really the priority on the capital spending to, to then push forward with, with these sort of maintenance, um, then th these problems are just going to continue to appear. OK, thank you very much. Um, Liam. Do we now follow up that, that line of questioning um, before turning to my, uh, my original question? The, I think m myself and a number of colleagues raised this with the, the Cabinet Secretary at the, the, the time of the reports, and I think the assurance was uh, uh, along the lines you suggested, uh, Mr Steele, that um, the concerns that have been, uh, have been raised uh, were being dealt with and a, and a fix put in, in place. Um, but it did rather beg the question, had it also triggered within um, Police Scotland and, and under the auspices of the, the SPA um, a, a, a look across the estate to see where um, further issues of, of, of this uh, kind had, had arisen? I, I take it from what you're saying that that hasn't taken place. Well, my belief is, is, is that on an individual level, commanders on the back of the L Division report have very much undertaken the same kind of uh, scrutiny of the buildings that they have res responsibility and name for. Uh, but, but I think to some extent we're, we're, we're kind of going down a blind alley if we think this is the services pro problem. Uh, the issue is undoubtedly that the service does not have sufficient money that's provided to it. And that, that starts uh, with, well, it doesn't start with the SPA, but the SPA should be the, the body that's making the, the noise about it. And it's for that particular reason that I uh, very pointedly suggested in my uh, uh, submission on behalf of the SPF that I believe the SPA is not discharging its statutory functions. Uh, it's very clear in, in, the, in terms of Section 2.3 of the Act that the authority must carry out its functions, and it goes on to say, uh, in a way which is, amongst other things, transparent. Uh, and the fact that the authority... Uh, through its uh, th through the people that work for it or through the service, is aware of the scale of the issues. These are things that should be getting discussed in a very public forum and very public correspondence should be getting sh shared with ministers to make sure that these things are being addressed. We wouldn't tolerate uh, our teachers working in these kind of conditions. We wouldn't tolerate our nurses working in, our, in these kind of conditions. We very clearly aren't prepared to tolerate our firefighters working in these kind of conditions because they were provided uh, with a capital settlement two years ago, which was twice that in cash terms of the police service. Yet when it comes to the police service itself, uh, there's a willingness to some, somehow rub it here, the concerns of those that are delivering the service, the conditions that they're working in, which in, in, in some areas are, you know, you, you know, a complete and utter embarrassment. Uh, I, I shared uh, b before this committee uh, a, a, a link to another series of pictures, which have just been taken in the past few days and weeks, uh, about some of the very issues that are available across the, the totality of the police estate. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, I think it's unfair to point a finger of blame at the service when the authority is not making the case for more funding for uh, for for policing. On on that particular point, I mean, uh, you've you've referred there to to sort of rubber earing the, the concerns. I think there was uh, indeed an explicit um, accusation that the, the SPA were were downplaying <coughs> the the impact of the the, the shortfall in the capital um, uh, allocations uh, in terms of its impact on the delivery of policing. Is that would you? 
be prepared either to, to, to confirm that and, and maybe expand on, on that? Yes, so. absolutely. And, and whilst these are always matters of judgment and uncer or certainly interpretation, uh, I would, and I appreciate that you've probably got many better things to do of, a, of an evening, uh, but I would encourage you all to go and have a look at the live stream of the meeting uh, in, to the tail end of March when the budget was being presented uh, and listen to the level and depth of discussion that took place around uh, the, the allocation. I, th I believe the paper that was presented by the service uh, could in its own right have been stronger, but the level of interest as to the challenge of what the capital allocation for the service meant was pretty much non-existent. So I, I do believe, mm. strongly believe, that the authority uh, and, and you know, prob possibly uh, more the, the chair of the authority is deliberately trying to avoid conflict uh, or any kind of thing that might appear to criticise government for the funding that's made available to it uh, for reasons that I cannot genuinely understand. Uh, Another example would be that we had uh, a, a very uh, uh, prestigious panel, if I may use the term generously, uh, at our conference that we, we held uh, at the tail end of March. Uh, and at that conference, you would have struggled to differentiate between the role of the Cabinet Secretary and the answers that he was giving uh, to the questions that were being asked of him by delegates from the SPF to the role of the Chair of the SPA, who arguably presented a much stronger uh, defence of government position than would have been perhaps healthy for some one, uh, in the position that she occupies. Is, is that a concern that, that, that Unison and the Association share? Um, and so it's, I would say it's always been a frustration for Unison that um, someone from the authority or the service doesn't speak up to say there is not adequate funding for, mm -hmm. for policing. We've always said it. We've said it in a written submission um, for this session, um, and we, we do believe that. So, you know, I would share the sentiment that, that Mr Steele's presented there that, yeah, that, that you know, that there could be more said publicly. Mm -hmm. I think when you see the, the authority board meetings, you're reading between the lines, mm -hmm. but for someone to actually stand up and see it and, and say it to the government would be a much preferred stance. Mm -hmm. for In terms of the com commanders, obviously, have a, a duty of care to... to yeah, to um, I agree that um, statutorily the Scottish Police Authority have that role uh, on behalf of the uh, citizens of Scotland, on behalf, on behalf of the service, to um, speak on on behalf of them all into government in terms of funding, and and clearly the uh, all the evidence that that um, I have seen um, is pretty clear that the capital funding around a lot of these issues has been um, deficient for some period of time. You're absolutely right in terms of. Um, my members' responsibilities, and as I said earlier, they are personally and professionally aware of their responsibilities. It's been uh, some of them who have maybe come to the positions that they're in in recent times were uh, unaware, perhaps, through lack of training. Um, that's a matter which we have raised um, consistently with the service to make sure that officers who do hold positions of command, departmental management, are aware of their um, health and safety and other responsibilities. Um, some commanders have had inspection regimes in place for some time. Some are in the process of reinvigorating those. Um, so we're aware of that. The, the issue is that it is piecemeal. It is not systemically built in. I know that's something that um, the work by the SPF most recently has, has shone a light on that, um, and uh, there are moves by the service to make that a case. But again, it's the fundamentally, we can have a great system in place, we can have all the reporting in place, we can speak the truth to power and say there are buildings falling down, there are cars that are in backyards that can't go out. If there isn't the funding there to repair and replace those, then it's not moving the issue forward. So that takes us back round in the circular argument to the responsibility for that, um, speaking that uh, position forward in terms of um, the service on behalf of the people of Scotland and um, rests with the Scottish Police Authority. Thank you. Thank you. You, you talked, Mr Steele, about um, you would have hoped to have resolved some of the communication issues by now. Could, sorry, could you just clarify who that was with? Is that with the authority? Well, you'll recall, convener, that uh, under the under the uh, the previous, as, as was you called, the previous iteration of the authority, that uh, I had come here, I think, two years in succession, and advised that there would be no engagement whatsoever. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, the the new chair of the authority has changed that. We we have uh, we have uh, absolutely built in meetings into the into the shed, into the diary to make sure that we catch up on, on a regular basis. But the, actually, the wider engagement has, has been with the service itself. Uh, we've uh, we've had direct uh, direct meetings with the uh, deputy chief officer who's made us aware of the finance, and also with the the chief finance officer himself. Can I ask in relation to ASPs and and Unison if that's 
Is it a similar situation? Um, likewise, the lines of communication, DCO page, um, the finance officer, as I say, we've had um, much more openness and transparency in terms of the the budget lines, the paperwork, the decision making, the prioritisation around some of that. Um, dialogue with the authority has been with the chair in that sort of more general sense rather than the specifics. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yeah, this is their experience also. You know, saying, um, the the new chair of the authority has um, um, changed the the engagement. We 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 meet together in in a forum. Um, and to discuss um, the issues uh, uh, in general terms, as uh, Mr. Marshall said, but the um, so there are improvements there, um, um, and we do speak with the finance um, officers at Police Scotland. Um, sometimes we do have to request them to come, but we do eventually do get that engagement that we're looking for. Okay, thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, Mr. Steele, you said that um, Police Scotland's case um, could have to the SPA for the capital budget could have been stronger. Is there any chance that the SPA don't realise the severity of the estate problems? Uh, if there are, then every one of them should resign en masse because they have an absolute responsibility for making sure that they are absolutely fully aware of what they are responsible for. Um, but the short answer is, is that I don't believe there is. I, I, I'm reluctant to kind of get into this just now, but, you know, you know, in for a penny. Uh, I, I suspect that the communications that take place between the service and the authority uh, are not too dissimilar to the concerns that were in existence in the past around about the relationship that existed between the former police boards and the former chief constables. And I suspect that what the service wants to say, it probably says in early iterations of papers that go to the authority, but by the time there have been a number of side meetings, what actually goes to the authority is a watered-down version of what the service believes need to be said publicly. Uh, I base that on nothing more than 26 years of cynicism and knowing exactly how these relationships have worked in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we all received the, the photographs of, of aspects of the estate, quite, quite grim um, pictures. I'm trying to get an idea of how representative that is, because it's obviously a, a large estate that the police have. So how representative are those pictures that you sent? Well, I think we, we, we have to realise that you know the, the police service is not at a, at a standstill position in anything. We have relatively modern buildings, we have new buildings, and we have, frankly, decrepit buildings. Uh, Paisley office is pretty much held together with black and yellow hazard tape. Uh, the air office, I think, was probably carved out of asbestos. Uh, there is so much asbestos in the building, that's the, the general belief that we have. Uh, but even, even our relatively new buildings are falling into a state of disrepair because no money is being spent in maintenance. They look tired and they look shabby. Uh, and it's not just the physical building, it's also what's contained within it. Uh, the, the series of uh, the, the link that I posted the, this, this lunchtime uh, also highlights that there are some fairly significant risks and dangers to the manner in which our buildings are slowly declining. Uh, we have water coming in in and around electricity points. We have water coming in and around stairwells. Our floors are not maintained. One of the biggest causes of uh, workplace payouts are slip, trips and falls. Uh, and these kind of things in their own right place significant additional pressure upon a police service with very little money. Uh, so in, insofar as the pictures are illustrative of what we found in the buildings that we've been in, I think it would be fair to say that the general maintenance picture across the totality of the estate, with the exception of probably the Gucci buildings, to, to use uh, military parlance, uh, of Gart Kosh, although a window did fall in there in the past number of years, uh, and also in Dalmarnock, the, you know, the arguably the two flagship premises that we have, that the, the, the buildings are beginning to look tired, they're looking shabby, Coverings are coming off walls, floor coverings are wearing away, uh, and like I say, the, 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 the Paisley office, as of for instance, uh, has got so much uh, yellow and black hazard tape uh, pasted upon it that I suspect it probably comes in by the puff load on a monthly basis to, uh, to keep the place together. Okay, thank you. I think we've got the picture there. Mr Marshall, um, you, you talked about the health and safety inspection and report. Can you just clarify when that might be forthcoming? Um, you know, when we talked about the risks in, in the estate, you said that health and safety were doing our report. Is that what you said? No, I think there's a, I believe there's a process has been trying to make a more systemic approach to this. So I'm aware from colleagues that they're 
Um, if they haven't already had that in place in terms of a um, regular inspection regime, as I say, maybe because they've come to the role recently and don't understand that was part of their responsibilities, but um, to amalgamate that up so every commander has the opportunity um, to feed in to a centralised point in terms of the health and safety uh, function within the service to highlight what they believe the prioritised issues are across their part of the state uh, and flag that up um, so that there's a a fully corporate knowledge of what the issues are. But that will extend from holes and roofs and water running in to tiles off walls. But again, the, the problem with some of the prioritisation around about some of that is you can spend lots of money on the on some of the things which are the most obvious. But even tiles off a wall um, sounds, doesn't sound very much. But if that means that the shower block, and this is a, a real case in a what on the face of it looks like a good building. If the shower block's out of commission because the tiles are off the wall, then officers and staff don't have anywhere to shower either before or after their shift or whatever it happens to be. There are some basic hygiene factors around about some of that. And if it takes months of wrangling by the commander or the area commander to secure enough funding to do that and then find um, to get workmen to come and uh, who may or may not be vetted and to get them into the building to plaster the wall, to put the tiles back on. If that takes somewhere between six and nine months, then there's a significant issue there for our officers and staff. And just, uh, sorry to pressure this, but just the, the time scale of, you're talking about some kind of collective report from the area commanders uh, on, on, you know, on, on their, their own um, particular buildings. Um, when do you expect, is that, is it going to happen and when do you expect it to happen? You know, and who's going to pull it together? Again, it's a matter that the service, I think, under DCC Taylor has instigated um, a piece of work, um, obviously, to try and amalgamate that into something. I think that's a question in terms of the time scales and what that looks like would be a matter for um, the service and the health and safety leads to pull that together and give you uh, an accurate reflection of that. My position should be that should be done as quickly as possible, but it has to be done uh, honestly, forthrightly uh, and as fulsome as possible. Maybe the committee could be kept updated when, when that comes together. Can you update the committee on the re results of that? I'm happy to update, provided we get sight of it. Yes, yeah. obviously. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we may well write Police Scotland to ensure you do get sight of it. I think that would be very helpful for, for all concerned that, that we did. Are you, are you complete? Yes, oh, yes sir. Sir, thank you. Uh, Liam, next, thank you. I mean, uh, Police Scotland have, have, have said that in, in light of the, the funding settlement that I, I think it's agreed uh, across the board, I think even the, the Cabinet Secretary in, in evidence he's given has accepted this fact. Um, given where we are with the capital spend, Police Scotland have indicated that the priorities in terms of delivering on health and safety and, and, and sort of statutory requirements. What is the view of the panel um, as to the success of even achieving that sort of bare minimum, if you like? Uh, they're not, um, and I, I, I mean, I don't want to make this all about the, the recent L division, but mm. the simple fact is, is that uh, we had police officers that were housed in buildings that did not have HMO licences. Uh, HMOs require uh, additional certificate, certification in terms of uh, gas and electric. They didn't exist. Those are straightforward breaches of the law. Uh, we know, because of the actions that have been taken in terms of uh, some of the cell accommodation, that the cells were not uh, were not uh, fit for uh, fit for the the, the use. And we also know that the uh, the cost, uh, the identified cost of bringing the buildings up to fire and building regulation standards, uh, comes in somewhere in the region of three hundred million pounds. Now. The fact that the service and the authority know that they have buildings that do not meet the fire and building regulation standards and still continue to operate them quite clearly shows that they're not meeting the, the health and safety obligations, mm. regardless of the desires or stated intention to do so. Mm. I mean, again, given the, given the accepted shortfall in the, 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 the capital allocation, is there anything in, in your view that should be being done differently with the allocation that is there that would better achieve at least that bare minimum of, of health and safety and, and, and statutory provision? I, I do think that's, I do think that's a, a, a difficult uh, equation to balance, mm -hmm. given, given what we've got. But uh, I mean, there, there are things that the service does. Um, 
uh, often, uh, often prompted, but sometimes not, uh, to ensure compliance. So, for example, we recently found, and I know that there was much publication about it, at the, much uh, publicity about it at the time, that the vehicles we have, because they're bought at such a relatively low spec, do not meet the expectations of the police service. Mm -hmm. By the time we put in the safety equipment and the and the allow for the weight uh, of the uh, of the occupants with their own uh, with their own uh, equipment that they have to carry with them, uh, we, we we highlighted to the to the service that use of the vehicles in general uh, activities would result in them being overloaded. Uh, so the service put in place mitigation by issuing safety alerts, arguably. Uh, uh, in conjunction with the SPF to make sure that instruction was given that no more than three occupants would be in a vehicle at any one time, for instance. Uh, we also identified that the safety equipment that was utilised for marking or for locus protection uh, on our roads did not meet the British standard for re reflectivity and size. So that was withdrawn. So all of these kind of th these kind of mitigation um, activities do take place when the issue is, is highlighted. Uh, but when you have floors that are got more trip hazards on them than you almost have tape and a roll to to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of mitigation takes you so far. But in its own right, it eventually starts to present a hazard in in, in itself because people become blind to uh, blind to uh, hazards of, of of that magnitude. That, I mean, that does suggest back to the point I think colleagues were raising earlier about the the level of communication there is beyond an an an, an, in, an initial conversation around budgetary priorities that that there would be some value in having then a more granular discussion about how those sorts of issues are addressed. Because from what you're describing, Police Scotland are are spending and then having to spend again, either for mitigation or in terms of replacement, because what they what they've purchased first time round has has been um, uh, has been a false economy, effectively. Uh, indeed, and and also what what is purchased to replace is also at the lower end, so it tends to have a shorter shelf life than you would expect. Mm. Um, we, we we I mean we are, we are hopeful that the replacement vehicles will not have the same weight issues that those vehicles that they're replacing currently have, but mm. we'll only find that out when we bring them in and test them. Mm. Uh, I mean, to some extent, this kind of takes us into a slightly, um, uh, you know, a, a slightly um, a tan a tangential discussion around about the awareness and uh, knowledge that goes into informing the decisions around about purchase and procurement. Um, but you know, if if we if we have very little and we have to stretch it a long way, invariably the quality of what is replaced. Uh, is every bit as poor and often poorer than, if even if newer uh, than than what it uh, than what it's uh, replacing. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would come in Sorry. to speak on that as well. Um, to say that I can only speak with 14 years worth of cynicism, but I can see <laughs> in um, you know what's <laughs> what's being provided um, as a budget to Police Scotland. And then they're making decisions based on that, that this is all that we have to spend. What are we going to be able to purchase? What are we going to be able to do with it? I would like to see that the engagement in terms of pre-budget maybe goes to the people who effectively are going to be using that equipment. So if they're going to come down and speak to police officers and to staff members, you know, um, I was inundated with calls from, from the, the, the mechanics who were able to tell me about these vehicles not being mm -hmm. sufficient. Um, you know, if they knew they had that knowledge and perhaps that wasn't considered at procurement level, I don't know, but you know, that, that engaging with those people would perhaps allow them to find a way to spend this more effectively if that's all you've got. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that you don't want to dilute the, the overarching argument about the, the, the insufficiency of the capital budget, but I think whatever point you're at, you would want to make sure that the what allocation is there is being used as efficiently and effectively as, as, as possible. Yeah, I speak with 30 years of optimism, maybe that's... Um, um, and a superintendent's pension behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want us to leave the room at this stage? <laughs> Going to play this <laughs> Paid for from my contributions too. Um, uh, from my point of view, and I, I say that in all seriousness, you know, there is a bit about the fact that we as a service uh, are a, a can-do organisation, and sometimes we're our own worst enemies of getting through and making the most of, of certain things. Um, but objectively, um, in terms of that decision-making and the prioritisation, uh, as we've all said, you know, we weren't part of any 
pre-briefing on that. We weren't involved other than the 2026 broad consultation about how those priorities were reached. We were briefed um, by the service about a very difficult um, position that they found themselves in with a very small cake, which they had to slice up. And, you know, not being part of that, not being full of um, in possession of the full circumstances, it's not for me to second guess the decisions that they took in relation to that. And from my point of view, you know, as it was articulated, on there, there are certain things they have to do in terms of if that's replacing certain weaponry and bits and pieces so that we can be operationally competent to deal with certain threats, then th those are need to do things. The health and safety elements, yeah, there's a big long list, you know, and there's the very high risk, high risk, normal risk, you know, there's a whole list of those. And as Callum alludes, that could take up to three hundred million pounds to do all of that. So there's a there's a sort of prioritisation you have to apply to that. And then there's still the aspirations to do something in terms of the the ICT, um, so that we can move to a position where officers and staff are able to log in um, rather than have to travel hundreds of miles to get to a computer that's still got their login. So there's some very basic, it's not Gucci, it's not something looking designer, it's very basic ability to be able to operate and do their job. Um, so there's an aspiration to do that. So they're not just sort of spinning one plate, they're spinning a number of plates, and to try and do that, as I say, with a very small cake. I admire their, what they're trying to do, but it fundamentally, you know, it needs more to be able to do um, more of across that. We're not going to be able to do it all, and as I say, unless we had a programme, capital programme, that had sufficient funding over a period of time that allowed us to commission all the relevant elements of that and have that mapped and delivered over a period of time, we are talking about a five to ten year programme just to stabilise um, the issues in terms of health and safety, estate, fleet, equipment, and also to invest in an ICT uh, world that enables officers to operate in the 21st century. Mr. Stanley, I'm going to bring Fulton in, who's waited patiently here. Yes, thank uh, thanks. No, Fulton, um, we're just going to hear from Mr. Steele first, and then I'll have oh, right, okay. Sorry. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you, Convener. We, we also can't lose sight of the fact that the capital allocation is not entirely without strings. There are expectations that the service will spend some of it on its DDICT, digital data and ICT uh, pro programme. And, and I think that kind of goes against the ethos that the government certainly came to power on some significant time ago around about the removing of ring fencing. Uh, but if the, if, if the service has provided uh, capital funding with strings, that does not mean the services. I mean, I'm not saying that the service would not come to the same conclusions and determine that the strings are exactly what they would choose to spend the money on, but it doesn't deliver the, the full flexibility to the service to spend the money on what may be those priorities in year. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Fulton and then Daniel. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Good afternoon, panel. Um, You've actually started to touch on uh, where my line of questions are around, and it's around specifically around ICT. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, and as I say, I think you've already started to, to develop the answer, so I think I, I know where this, where this will go. But um, d do you feel, as a panel, that staff currently have access to ICT, which allows them to provide effective and efficient policing? And uh, the answer to that might not be a simple yes or no, I, I, I suspect, but where are there any gaps, if there are any? It's a simple no. Where do you see the main gaps being? Uh, in everything. I mean, I, I have in my pocket something, and I suspect every one of you the same, something more sophisticated and advanced than uh, the basic equipment that police officers are reliant upon. Uh, I know that my uh, colleagues in unison will speak with tremendous knowledge on the frustrations that their members have in maintaining uh, IT infrastructure, which is well past its best. Uh, it's not too recently that we've moved away from our version of Windows that Microsoft itself had stopped supporting. Uh, the fact that in this day and age, uh, we, uh, as Mr. Marshall highlighted, have to move uh, potentially hundreds of miles to get to log into a system uh, because you're programmed to a certain part of the network is, uh, is idiotic. Uh, the, the gaps are wide and varied. The world has changed. You can, you know, you can, order, a, you can order and book a holiday in your phone uh, and nanoseconds, you should be able to do something similar uh, in terms of uh, checking whether someone's wanted or uh, establishing what your outstanding workload is without having to revert to a bit of paper with a reminder. 
that the gaps are so great uh, that uh, it's almost impossible to start to uh, narrate them in the time that's available to us just now. So, uh, I, th I think you've articulated that pretty well. That the, in, in terms of the gaps there, and um, you know, in, in terms of the simple answer that, that you gave as well. But what, what impact do you think that that's had on the ability of officers to um, you know, carry out an efficient uh, policing service? Because obviously, we also in this committee and and. Uh, the, um, the the larger full justice committee. We hear a lot of good reports of police work um, across a number of uh, different different areas. Um, so, is there any idea how the, the, these gaps, which seem very striking, uh, has impacted on that and how, what on well, the overall policing? It, it, it compounds a sense of frustration. I'm, I'm not in any way demuring from the fact that the officers that uh, are out there day and daily and right now and, among, and will be working night shift tonight are doing anything other than working as hard as you possibly can to deliver the best police service they can. Uh, but they are almost hindered at every single turn by the equipment and the facilities and the technology that's available to them. Uh, first of all, they've got to be lucky to get a vehicle that works to be able to get to the incident in the first place. Uh, then, uh, because of the pressure and the volume of calls, which is not a capital problem, but it's a problem nonetheless, uh, they spend uh, not as much time dealing with uh, complainers and victims as they might wish. Uh, and then, because of the requirement, uh, unavoidable requirement, for multiple entries across a whole variety of systems, uh, they spend more time dealing with uh, inefficient bureaucracy uh, that rather than being out there providing a service to the public. All of these things in their own right mean that the, the service that's been delivered is not as efficient or as effective or as professional as it could be. And we can't ignore the fact that in amongst all of these pressures, officers have so little time, they're not, many of them are not able to get properly refreshed. And even if they were able to get properly refreshed, they don't have the facilities within their buildings to be able to do so. So the, 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 I, I would encourage any single uh, member of the, of the committee to, when you go, if you want to go and visit a police station, don't do so by getting in touch with the divisional commander. Uh, do so by getting in touch with the SPF. Uh, come and see us and come and ask us, what, you know, can you come and have a look around a police station? Can you come and speak to, and I suspect Unison would say the exact same thing, uh, speak to Unison. Come and speak to our officers, come and speak to our staff direct. Uh, don't go and listen to the hand-picked Harris that will almost certainly be rounded up uh, to tell you how glorious uh, things are uh, when the reality is somewhat different. Thanks for that um, really um, kind of robust response. But I'm wondering if any of the other panel would want to come in. And I suppose what I'm what I'm looking for is um, is a, a non-police person. I think only our convener has, has got experience in working directly in the, in the police. What? Because we're hearing that the technology is not really suitable or up to date. But I want to know a real life example of how that's effect impacted on a bit of, of police work, you know, that would be in, for example, the public interest. I don't know if Ivor Marshall you were wanting in there. So I was going to answer your question uh, first in terms of um, effectiveness and efficiency. I think, I personally think that uh, police calling is effective. All the statistics um, in terms of uh, performance indicators, um, but more significantly in terms of the quality of data, what the public say, um, in terms of surveys and uh, what the interactions are, um, suggests that policing in Scotland is amongst the best in uh, across the UK, across Europe, uh, and maybe even on a global sense. That fundamentally, for me, policing is it's a human endeavour. It involves the men and women of, of Police Scotland uh, interacting with the citizens of Scotland and people who visit Scotland, and that's done to a very high standard. Efficiency is a different thing. That's about how um, uh, productive the officers can be. And issues in terms of ICT, um, the working environment that, that they're in, the vehicles that they use, the equipment that they have, those are enablers in terms of how well, how productive they can be in the time that they are at work. Um, and I think we've alluded to the fact that um, with proper investment, with better equipment, with more uh, uh, safe environments for people to work in, they could be even more effective than they are in terms of that. Um, but I just uh, I don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that um, the Police Service of Scotland is going to hell in a handcart. It's not. It's built upon the endeavours and the motivation and the hard work of the men and women of the service. So you know, I really want to make that point clear. In terms of you know answering your question specifics, um, if you know I 
maybe a bit far removed from it, but if people are having to queue up in the in at the end of their shift um, to get onto a computer so they can um, download stuff or input material or whatever it happens to be, as opposed to being able to, to do it in a effective way during the course of their shift using mobile data and various other things, there's something not right there um, about the bandwidth and the, the equipment and how... Uh, up to date it is so you know they could just be much more productive and much more effective uh, as a consequence of that uh, rather than taking up any more time convener again because I, I realize that we're quite short for time i would just like to make a, a final comment on that because i think that um that is you know i, I was almost feeling the only answer's been given that uh, there's almost two i think you've you've kind of summed up well but almost two uh, opposing views from, from our end of the table and that we're hearing a lot about a very effective police service in Scotland a police uh, service that's, that's um, doing a lot right and that came through the, the inquiry that the, the Mother Committee recently um, uh, recently committed to but th there is issues there with, with ICT that, that can, can be clearer as well so. Daniel, did you wish? I'll try and keep this brief because I think, but I think it's important. I mean, we obviously now have an ICT strategy, which is a big step forward. Um, but of the the transformation budget, 24.5 million is as allocated to IT transformation. On that basis, it would take around 10 years to achieve that. I'm just wondering if if uh, the panel could a give their comment about whether they think that is the the right program, and and really just that that whether that pace is even vaguely adequate, but also in terms of the things which are not being funded this year. So the National Cybercrime Infrastructure, GDPR, the Div Digital Evidence Platform and the Custody and Productions Remodelling, those would seem to be pretty important um, investments. I was just wondering if the panel could give some view both on that generality of the, the programme, but also those specific line items. Yeah, I mean, I would say... Um we live in a society where it's very commonplace to annually renew your phone. We have an ICT strategy that, as you've, you've, you've pointed out, could take over 10 years. That would be out of date by then. I have people sitting at their desks just now with computers that probably haven't been replaced in the last seven to eight years um, and working on systems quite recently an old version of Windows because um, there's licenses need purchased or updates need made on the software that runs on that platform and then needs to be updated for the newer uh, platform and there's maybe not the money there for that. The concern is that without the, the, the funding to, to bring in the, the, the strategy properly and efficiently that again it will be an expenditure that at the end of the run when we get to the end of the 10 years we're out of date in the same place again. Um, it will be no surprise to anyone that um, you know the, the criminal element doesn't have uh, any concerns about updating their IT technology and are well ahead of the police in, in terms of that. Um, and while their staff and officers are definitely delivering an effective service that we, we are all supportive of, we could be much more efficient and have greater capacity with a much better system behind us. Thank you. I uh, completely agree with that. The, the reality is, is that uh, this, with the speed with which technology develops, it's more likely than not that much of what would be purchased in year one would be out of date, not even by year 10, but by year five or six. Uh, and the requirement then to go back and reinvest in, uh, in the infrastructure again uh, would arguably be of greater priority than continuing to upgrade to try to get to the end, to the end point. Uh, but in terms of the specific issues that you highlighted, you know, productions, it's, it's, it's the kind of things that, you know, the evidence chain is, is highly reliant upon. Uh, the safe and effective and uh, secure tracing of productions is important, not just for the criminal justice system, but it's also important for the security of the people. And I, I mean job security uh, of the people that are charged with making sure that nothing goes, uh, nothing goes missing. Uh, and uh, these things are invariably made much more difficult uh, with... Uh, uh, with, uh, with without the, the technology to be able to make it happen. I mean, this this building alone is but a few short miles uh, away from one of the most advanced global companies in terms of logistics in the world, and Amazon. Uh, you know, they can track and move stuff in, in the blink of an eye. We should be able to do something similar. Um, and that's that, that's hugely, hugely uh, inefficient. I think there's a, a particular big risk uh, uh, with that. Yeah, we welcome the fact that there's in place now 
an ICT strategy. I think 10 years um, in its long uh, potential in terms of delivering against that is far too long given the pace of change. Um, but it is one of these sort of exponential things that just keeps on growing in, in the expectation. So um, we get that. And it's back to that point of we need a programme across ICT estates and, and all these other issues which you allude to that encapsulates that so that we can actually map that out, phase the funding of it. Because I do think, you know, trying to trying to secure 300 million up front to deliver some things across a, a public sector budget which is under strain is perhaps unrealistic. But spreading, you know, if it's 50 million over over six years or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, that that may be doable. You know, so 60 million for five years repeated is something then that can be monitored and so on and so forth. So I think that's that's the type of approach we need to have. And then if you think beyond that, we don't know what the future holds in terms of many things, but we know that technology is changing. We know there's going to be demands in the future, particularly around about um, uh, green elements for cars and buildings and so on and so forth. If we move to electric, you know, uh, there's a big cost to some of that. If, if the police service of Scotland even migrated to uh, using hybrid cars or electric cars going forward, or were forced to do that because of legislative change, whatever, at some point in the future, the costs with that even would be significant. So we need to future-proof and build in where is Police Scotland going to be in the next five to ten years as well beyond where we currently are? So we need to have that, that mindset as well, be looking beyond the the crises that we find, seem to find ourselves in in terms of buildings and cars and so on and so forth and build a stable stable platform that we can go forward and continue to invest in the service. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I thank you for coming? I, I, I heard things slightly different. I don't hear anyone say other than, as Fulton said, that um, the officers and staff of Police Scotland are doing a very fine job, notwithstanding the challenges, is what I heard. And can I assure you that we'll be following this up with the Cabinet Secretary and putting robust questions to him. And whilst I can't obviously speak for the Cabinet Secretary, I know that these uh, meetings and our discussions with him will help his discussions with colleagues in future budgets. So hopefully we'll see some change in that. So thank you very much. And I'll briefly suspend to clear the public gallery. Thank you. Thank you.